Park. Ship. Out of danger. Yes. Don't grieve him, Admiral. It is logical. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Or the one. Everybody and welcome to Geekfest France. My name is Carlos Peron, and joining me today I have Steve Avona. Say hi, Steve. Hey, Carlos. Well, today we are continuing in a way with what we started last week, and that is we're kind of paying homage to Leonard Nimoy. He recently passed, and we started going over his career and all the different aspects of media that he touched because he wasn't just an actor, he did a lot of stuff. And we kind of obviously we can't help ourselves we focus really on a lot on star trek but he has done a lot of other stuff and today we have steve like i mentioned earlier he is going to give us a little more of his personal involvement or his personal experiences of actually seeing him in person conventions you know special events and that sort of thing plus mm -hmm. he'll tell us a, a little bit about you know what Nimoy meant to him as part of being, you know, a very lead, important uh, member of the Star Trek family. So, Steve, uh, actually, why don't you tell us about what you knew about what was happening to him in terms of him being ill? Oh, well, I mean, he had been um, photographed, I guess, at by TMZ yeah. recently in a wheelchair. I, I guess it was maybe, I want to say close to two years ago, thereabouts, he had been coming into an airport and he looked really bad and he had an oxygen tank and all this other stuff. So there was, of course, all this, uh, you know, talk about what was wrong with him. Yeah, all the flags go up. Yeah. And, you know, he rather than ignore it, he decided to go public with the fact that he had COPD, which is cardiopulmonary obstructive something i mean it right. basically it's a breathing disorder as a result of years and years of smoking which he quit many many years ago i think uh, he said he quit about maybe 30 years ago yeah that's what i read but sadly the damage was already done and uh, you know i mean it's terrible but the fact that the man lived to be in his 80s yeah, no is, is not so you know i mean he, he's lucky uh, if he had smoked his entire life to have all that time after quitting. But yeah, he started to scale back his personal appearances. He retired from the convention circuit and then he started to, you know, he realized that there was still a demand for him at these things. So he started to Skype into these different conventions. Wow. And uh, he, I think he did that at least five times. And, uh, you know, his grandson helped him do it. And he would still sign autographs. Uh, you know, the convention promoters would send him the stuff and he would sign. So, I mean, he still remained a very vital part of fandom. Very he, active. Yeah. Yeah. He had a Twitter feed that was updated constantly. And, uh, you know, again, he talked about the dangers. You know, he used his disease as a platform to advocate against smoking. And, and again, you know, he had a very sweet relationship with the fans and he started calling himself like our adopted grandfather. <laughs> and it was really nice to read his Twitter feed because he always remembered all the Trek people like on their birthdays or on the anniversaries of their passings. And uh, the thing that I remember most recently was that he was celebrating the 50th anniversary 
of the shooting of the cage, the Star Trek pilot. Wow. And he, you know, was sort of counting down because he knew the exact day that it started filming. And he wrote a little tweet to Jeffrey Hunter, who was the first captain. And, you know, it was very heartwarming to see how he interacted with us, with the fans. Uh, you know, he did that at conventions. He did that on social media. And it seemed at all times very genuine mm -hmm. and as opposed to some of the other <laughs> actors who you know we know either they were doing it for a paycheck or they were doing it to boost their own egos but he you know he was really not that kind of uh insecure person where he needed the adulation he felt as though he was giving back now it's true of course he was getting paid right. uh, and paid well to make these personal appearances but there's a difference between, you know, just collecting a paycheck and showing up and kind of rolling your eyes at everybody who is just thrilled to be in your presence and actually giving them their money's worth. And that's what he did, you know, and I have to believe, you know, that he really, you know, sure, you, you could, <laughs> you, you can always have more money, but I don't think he needed the money desperately. So... You know, he made quite a few appearances over the years into, like I said, well into his late 70s. Wow. So, uh, you know, and I was lucky enough to be in his presence at a, a couple of those functions. And, you know, it was always just a, a great experience for me. Do you think he was an actor that was always comfortable with the role of Spock in terms of being recognized for that primarily? Or is that something he had to kind of grow into? I think he grew into it. I think because he wrote that book, I Am Not Spock, in the mid-70s, I uh -huh. think that there was a definite sort of backlash people thinking that he was angry that he was sort of typed as Spock and that his opportunities as an actor were limited after Star Trek went off the air but that's not entirely true because the man worked yeah you know the man worked steadily and consistently throughout his career and in the 10 year period that Star Trek was not around he did TV movies he did stage work he did feature films maybe not you know the most successful, but he never lacked for work. And obviously, you know, he hosted In Search Of. So, you know, he was always, always working consistently. And I think that once the films came around and there was that bounce that he got, uh, not only as an actor, but as a director, mm -hmm. I think it certainly helped, you know, because it gave him more opportunities beyond Star Trek. And then it sort of, you know, with age comes wisdom and hindsight. Mm -hmm. And I think he definitely uh, accepted his place in sort of pop culture and the fact that that he helped, even though he didn't create Spock, that he helped mold this character into of one of the most yeah. well-drawn characters, in my opinion, in the history of, of any storytelling. And, you know, then in the mid-90s, he wrote another book and he called that I Am Spock. <laughs> And so to me, that meant, you know, we've come full circle here. He yeah. is very, you know, at peace with uh, his association with this role. It, it's brought him uh, countless opportunities. And, uh, you know, I think for the rest of his life, he was always grateful. Well, we definitely do recognize him for Star Trek. But just like a lot of these actors for, you know, that are of that age or of that era, you know, he had a, would you say, a typical climbing the ladder of Hollywood before Star Trek? What kind of shows do you remember that he did? Because I know you wrote a piece and we published it very recently, uh, as soon as uh, Nimoy passed, about his background and some of his earlier 50s and 60s work. Well, he did in the 50s, he definitely, the stuff that he did would, you would consider to be somewhat unremarkable. He was in a lot of B movies. He was in a serial called Zombies of the Stratosphere, which I believe was his, his maybe his second screen credit. Wow. And then, you know, he got to a point and I, you know, jump ahead to when I actually met him, you know, discussed the fact that he did a little stint in the army in the in middle 50s and came out and he was driving a taxi. Wow. And he was not getting real consistent work. Sounds like a typical, uh, you know, struggling actor. Very much so. I think the quote from him was that before Star Trek, he never worked more than two weeks consistently oh, as an actor. So he was living, you know, very much hand to mouth. He even got to a point, I think in the late 50s and early 60s, where he was doing a lot of teaching. And he was teaching acting. Oh, my God. And, you know, with, with certain other of his peers. But between that... And then the acting started to pick up again in the late 50s and early 60s as sort of a, as a guest player, as somebody, you know, he had a look, 
And that look sort of lent itself to playing kind of uh, villainous roles, you know, kind of ethnic roles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so he got work. And, you know, as Star Trek approached, he worked in westerns, he worked in cop shows, he was on the Twilight Zone once. That's you know, right. That's so right. he, oh, and he was also on The Outer Limits, two episodes of The Outer Limits. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, he was building a resume, but he still, you know, by his mid 30s, I don't think he was a name. You know, he was more of a that guy. <laughs> he was probably more. Oh, I remember that guy. You know, he was probably more of a, you know, what we would consider today to be more of a Lance Henriksen, Bill Paxton. Oh, wow. Kind of a guy. A genre guy. <laughs> but, well, not genre, but just like a that guy. Like, oh, I know that guy. You know, you know not necessarily a You don't sci-fi remember his guy, name, but you recognize the but, face. you know, you've seen him enough that yeah. you just know, you know, oh, he's, pretty, he's a good actor. I like him, but I don't know his name. Well, let's jump a little to, obviously, the most famous thing, and that is his role of Spock. Why don't you tell me a little bit about, you know, how his chemistry was with Shatner in terms of we've heard so many stories about them kind of butting heads, but then being best friends and and com- right. being competitive. But he seemed to have a different approach to the whole thing that Dan Shatner did. What do you know about that? Well, I would backtrack it a little to when he first got the role on Star Trek or when he first shot the pilot and he was cast against Jeffrey Hunter, who was Captain Pike. Correct. Nimoy, by his own admission, said that he really felt had Jeffrey Hunter gone on to play the role as of the captain in Star Trek that his role as Spock would not have taken off the way it had because it was the chemistry with Shatner that helped propel his characterization of Spock because we all know that Shatner is this very boisterous, bombastic. <laughs> People could, you know, if they're speaking negatively, they could say he's hammy, he's you know, he's an overactor, all this other stuff. And that can be true, but you know, he's also just I'd like to say when he's, you know, good, he's just an enthusiastic performer. He projects charisma and authority and, you know, he's just that he's passionate, so passionate that it allowed Nimoy to take the role of Spock in the opposite direction. If you look at the early episodes of Star Trek, if you look at the two pilots, if you look at the first, I'd say, five, six episodes, you see a character that's very much in flux. You see a character that's not fully formed. Mm-hmm. He, he's, you know, talking about the whole no emotions thing right. and blah, blah, blah. And it's nothing unusual for, you know, for early shows. They have to, everybody has to kind of, you know, wear their shoes for a while. They have to get comfortable. Right. right. And and he's sort of, you know, maybe not owning the character as much as he did in later episodes. But you see him sort of get emotional. You see him yell. You see him, you know, I mean, and that's not with any sort of alien influence. That's just the character. So probably, you know, I'd say by like the 10th episode of the first season, he's Spock. He's calm, collected, logical, efficient, you know, non-emotional. And he's bouncing off of Shatner Mm -hmm. brilliantly. And the writers start to write to that relationship. And even DeForest Kelly, he bounces off of him too. Oh, well, DeForest, I was just going to mention DeForest Kelly. I mean, once there was the sort of antagonistic chemistry that they developed or that, that maybe the writers wrote, you know, a few lines here and there and saw how well they played off each other, that became, for me, in all honesty, it's not the Kirk Spock relationship that I love as much as the McCoy Spock relationship <laughs> that I love as much. Wow. And that, that even plays itself into the movies as well. That really, really, I don't, it just makes me smile. I mean, But of course, you know, Nimoy and Shatner, they played off each other brilliantly, but it's true during the series, they were not best friends because Shatner was jealous. Nimoy started to grab a lot of attention, (laughs) not on purpose. You know, he was just playing his role, but his role resonated with teenagers, with adults, with women, with everybody. I mean, you would not think that this non-emotional character would, but he, because he was the outcast, because he was the one that didn't fit in, he just appealed to everybody. And, you know, Shatner, Kirk was the square-jawed Horatio Hornblower, you know, typical hero. And to not to say that he was bad, but he was just not, you know, Nimoy was getting tons of fan mail and, you know, Shatner was feeling pissy and jealous and you know uh tried to kind of upstage him and you know nimoy was nominated for an emmy where shatner never was oh my god so you know there was a a tension between them but i don't think that it ever boiled over into anything really 
you know, like a real scene. Right. Uh, you know, they might have, you know, sent memos to Gene Roddenberry about this or that or, you know, Shatner, you know, who as was he was famous for trying to like change scripts and steal lines. And, <laughs> you know, he did that to all the actors, not just wow. Nimoy. But, you know, so their friendship really came into play during the era of the movies when that's really when they got to be as close as they were up until the end. Now, the fact that at one point Nimoy is offered the opportunity to direct, did that also create friction with Shatner? Oh, sure. I mean, and, and if you hear, you know, Shatner jokes about it now and Nimoy joked about it, but the sense was that Shatner was going to make life as difficult for him as he possibly could Man. when he was chosen for director. And then something happened. You know, Shatner, he wised up after a while. And they, they both, you know, realized that the two of them were so integral to Star Trek that why not, instead of like sort of fighting against each other, why not fight the studio together? <laughs> you know, they started, their contracts were written sort of together. They developed what they called the favored nations clause. Exactly. And then, you know, so whatever Nimoy got, Shatner got and vice versa. So Nimoy got to direct two of the films and then Shatner got to direct. Now it wasn't good, but he got the opportunity. Right. You know, and they made the same kind of money. And, you know, so I think it was probably in that sort of early to mid eighties period that they really started to become tight. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the appearances that you were actually uh, able to go to the conventions and the, you know, the special presentations and stuff like right. that? You know, how would he behave in public and that sort of thing? Well, as I said at the top of the show, I mean, he his reputation was great. And I can remember being so excited. I met him twice. One time was a traditional convention setting and the other was a sort of a an odd event that just I got very lucky to be at. The first one was the convention, and that was great. It was a typical uh, creation show. It was in New Jersey, and I went to uh, with a friend, and he was there. He did two presentations. One where it was, you know, your traditional Q&A, about 45 minutes of him taking questions, mostly about Star Trek. And then he did a, an evening presentation, which was more having to do with, he was just sort of getting his photography off the ground. Okay. And he was showing his photographs to us, doing like a slide presentation. It was an opportunity, they made it clear that this was an opportunity to talk to him about like non-Trek stuff. <laughs> so, but it was great because you had the first, where you could get all your Trek stuff out of your system. And then you go to the second thing where in the evening where it's a little bit different. So that was kind of a really nice experience. And of course, you know, you got the autograph session and you got the photo op session. And of course, you know, I wasn't going to pass it up. I forget whatever, how much money I spent. I didn't care. And, <laughs> uh, but what I remember, what, what struck me. There were a few experiences at that event that struck me that I never forgot. One was that I got up to the mic to ask a question that I'm, I'm sure he had been asked a hundred times before in the 20 years since uh, Star Trek II. And I asked him like how he felt about you know Spock dying and how he felt as he played the scene and did he really think that it was the end, that he was never going to play him again. And, and I kind of knew what he was going to say, but I wanted to actually just have the experience of asking the question. And he was extremely thoughtful and he, he was joking around too, because I said, you know, I said, oh, I said, you know, you and Mr. Shatner, that scene, it's a beautiful scene and you're both great in it. And he looked at me and he said, was he there? Was he there? I, I don't remember. Was he there? And he was, yeah, everybody got a big laugh. And then uh, he went on to talk about, I mean, in great depth about Everything I asked, and then he kind of went on and on and on, and it was just wonderful. Yeah, he, he's not a yes, no type of guy, I guess. Yeah, and I just stood there, and you know, in his presence, you know, like 10 feet away from him, and a friend of mine snapped like eight pictures of, of me <laughs> talking to him. So that was great. That interaction was great. Then when we took our pictures with him, now here's the fundamental difference between him and William Shatner, because Shatner was at that show separately, and they did their stuff separately. But we did the photo op with Nimoy and we all, you know, waited online and we got up to it. We got our turn and Nimoy, he held his hand out. He said, you know, hi, what's your name? You said your name. He shook your hand and he kept your hand in his hand for the picture. So you're shaking <laughs> hands with him in the picture. And, you know, 
you're just like on cloud nine. I don't know how else to describe it. It's nerdgasm. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like this guy, you know, again, I'm not stupid. I know he's getting paid. Even if he's acting, he's doing a great performance. It's the kind of fan experience you want. Right. And Shatner was the exact opposite. Now, I didn't even, I know better than to, you know, try to, you know, I know him, I know his reputation, so I don't. I'm never disappointed by my interactions with him because I don't try. But I remember when we took the pictures with him, he didn't even look at me. And he sat like he was so creeped out by having to sit next to all these people. And I wasn't like dressed like a Borg or anything. I mean, <laughs> I was just in my regular clothes. And, you know, I mean, I got a you know, like a little smile out of him. And I said, hello, Mr. Shatner. And I think he nodded at me. And that was the extent of it. But you can just see the difference between him and Nimoy, and that's it's just to me so sad that he has that sort of disposition towards the fans and doesn't get it. As much as he claims that he gets it, he doesn't. Right. Nimoy right. got it, and he doesn't. Well, one of the things that I think Shatner gets a lot of credit for that a lot of actors probably try to do and are not as successful as him is in the way that he kind of diversifies and reinvents himself. What I find that funny is the fact that Nimoy has done so many other things that are kind of, you would consider to be a little bit out of character. He's done so many funny things. Not only has he done the, the stereotypical, you know, records that, you know, the spoken word stuff that it's kind of experimental right. in a way. And nowadays we can kind of find them funny, but he's also done commercials that are funny and he kind of pokes fun at himself. And he's done, I think he even did a, a music video uh, also uh, that, you know, he keeps participating and he doesn't mind kind of joking along with the persona that he's created. Yeah, but you know what? The thing about him is that, you know, Shatner, he'll do anything for a buck and he has no problem being a total buffoon. Whereas Nimoy, everything he's ever done up until the end, like that car commercial he did with Zachary Quinto yeah, yeah. was great and it was he always maintained his dignity even if he was laughing or even if it was humorous Shatner is always playing the fool and you know he'll like I said he'll do anything for a dollar but Nimoy always sort of was in control of that persona in control of how he was portrayed and never did anything Star Trek or otherwise that was either an embarrassment to Spock or an embarrassment to him. Mm. I, even even the Bilbo Baggins thing. I mean, that, you know, all right, that was of its day. <laughs> but, but Shatner continued to make a jackass out of himself for another f almost 50 years. You know, and again, he made, he did some good things too. I'm not saying he didn't. But, you know, there's a huge, huge difference between the two of them and how they conducted themselves. Just to, you know, I, I, I don't want to forget my other interaction with him that was outside of the convention setting, which was really my favorite. Mm -hmm. About two years after that convention, I was going to California to, I don't know if it was my first or my second Grand Slam convention in Pasadena. And that was not just a Star Trek convention. It was sort of all genre stuff. It was it was Lost. It was Battlestar. Yeah, it was Firefly. It was End Trek and whatever else. Okay. So he was not part of that Shatner was part of it but he was not but it just so happened and I you know following all the Trek websites even back then there was an announcement that at the Egyptian theater on Hollywood Boulevard they were doing a retrospective of this very very obscured producer uh, by the name of Jack Broder but it just so happened that Nimoy appeared Nimoy's first film was for this man and they had gotten Nimoy to appear. They were going to do a double bill of these two films. Nimoy and Jack Larson, who played Jimmy Olsen in Superman, were both in this film. Wow. So you had two huge pop culture icons <laughs> in the same place. And they were going to show the film, do a Q&A, and then show the next film. And the film was called Kid Monk Baroni. And it, he, Nimoy played this Italian kid, this from the wrong side of the tracks, <laughs> a boxer who was kind of steered in the wrong direction by, you know, whoever. And it was sort of like a, you know, total B-movie slash Bowery Boys kind of thing. And he was going to be there. And I was like, well, of course, I'm going to go to that. And <laughs> it, it was the day that I was getting into California. So I remember ordering my tickets online and I said to myself, my God, this is going to be a mob scene. <laughs> you know, I'll be lucky if I get in. I hope my plane is on time, blah, blah, blah. 
it was sort of a nightmarish experience because my flight was late. Oh, my God. I had to scramble to get from Burbank to I went to Burbank, then to Pasadena, then to Hollywood. And I just barely got there in time. I was expecting these hordes of people, you know, for Star Trek and right. Superman and whatever. And it was extremely quiet. It was not sold out. The theater was maybe half full. Wow. And I'm saying to myself, I, is he even going to show up? And I remember accidentally sitting in the reserve seats for him. No one, you know, I, I, no one told me to move. I saw that I was in his seat and I left. But then he got there and he was in a very sort of jovial mood. And I remember watching the film and he was laughing at his own performance. He seemed very happy to be there. He was, you know, it wasn't like he, he arrived halfway into the movie. He, you know, sat through the whole movie. And then they did this very sort of spirited Q&A where, again, I got to ask him a question. And again, I had that, you know, experience where he gave me a very thoughtful answer. And he, you know, Star Trek was barely touched upon mm -hmm. during the whole evening. And that was the great part about it. How often did something like this come about? I mean, every sort of personal appearance the man made at that point had to do with Star Trek. And, you know, he, him and Jack Larson from Superman, they, they were talking about other things and their early careers and, and the, the experience of making this film. And it was just terrific. And I, you know... This might be too much information, but after the whole thing broke up, I remember being online for the men's room and he got behind me and somebody walked up to him and Usher said, you know, Mr. Nemo, we have <laughs> we we have a private restroom. You don't need to do this. And he's like, no, it's fine. No worry about it. And I can honestly say that <laughs> Leonard Nimoy was next to me at a urinal. Wow. And uh, and then after that was over, I mean, I think they were having a little reception, but I think he was done. So he, I sort of hovered around him because I did have something for him to sign. And even though they had said, you know, this is a no autograph event, the minute he walked out of the building, he was swarmed. Wow. And when I say swarmed, it was maybe 10 people because, again, I just don't think the word had gotten out about this event. So he signed everything. You know, I can say I got a free Leonard Nimoy autograph and all the other ones I had to pay for. He signed and he was very cool and then he left and those were my two experiences with him and i'm you know always grateful to have had the experience but more grateful to have had the second experience over the first because even though they were both great i can say that i had an interaction with him that very few people did uh, very few fans did and and that was that was terrific do you think that as we unfortunately and uh, you know unavoidably we start losing some of these actors from you know from the original series whether they're the b players the scotties or 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 the a players like like deforest and 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 leonard do you think it's kind of like there's a point of no return where the show is officially you know out there you know and gone when some of these main people pass yeah well i mean there was talk before you know before he got sick there was a lot of talk that he and Shatner were going to be in the next Star Trek film. Yeah. Now, whether yeah. or not they still use Shatner, oh, I, don't, I have no idea what the storyline is going to be. You know, I've been on record as hating these films, but <laughs> just the fact that, you know, I can watch the first one because he's in it. And I can watch the first one, and it makes me smile to when he shows up, and his little scene with Zachary Kinto at the end is great. So you had a sense like, well, if they put him and Shatner together in the last one, then, you know, of course I'm going to go see it. And, you know, but now, yeah, he's gone. I mean, you know, I don't know how they're going to do the next film. I have really no sense of what it's going to be about and if they'll, you know, give Shatner a role. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think we're definitely with him. I think that the door is closed. I mean, you know that, the other smaller actors have done a lot of fan films, and that's great. I'm not a huge – I don't watch every fan film there is. Mm -hmm. But when somebody like George Takei, Walter Koenig, Nichelle Nichols does one, well, then I'm going to watch it. And there was one that Tim Russ directed called Of Gods and Men where so many, not just the you know cast members but the guest stars were in, and I loved it. I mean, it was – whether it's canon or any of that crap, you know, it was just great to see them play the characters. But as far as anything official, 
I think we're definitely done. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Even though I, you're, you're absolutely right, Shatner will continue, you know, until his end, he will continue because that's the type of guy he is. He likes yeah. to hustle, he likes to work. But yeah, you kind of feel like you lost, you didn't just lose another actor, you lost a gigantic chunk of Star mm -hmm. Trek, you know, over these last couple of days. Yeah. Well, Steve, I would like to thank you, first of all, for joining me today and for giving us some of your own personal stories and thoughts on, you know, what a tragic thing this thing was. But yeah, it's my also. Pleasure kind of like a celebration of his work because the man there is so much material out there for you to see whether it's serious material or funny material or you know diehard sci-fi material it's mm -hmm. all out there for our viewers and for you guys to listen to so on behalf of everybody here at geek fest rants i'd like to thank you for joining us and we'll see you here next time bye bye everybody my father says that you have been my friend you came back for me. You would have done the same for me. Why would you do this? Because the needs of the one outweighed the needs of the many. I have been, and ever shall be, your friend. Yes. Yes, Spock. The ship. Out of danger, you saved the ship. You saved us all. Don't you remember? Jim. Your name is Jim. Yes. Mm -hmm.